Hi, my name is Rob Sweeney. I'm the author of You're Not Just a Diagnosis, Using Trauma-Informed Techniques to Create Your Best Life. And I'm talking today with Ali Ahmed and Brandon McGowan about a film they recently completed, a short film called um, Buried and Forgotten, which was written, produced, directed, and stars Ali. The story is a neo-noir film about um, an alcoholic who's come home after a very long time. You know, it's been more than a year. And um, he's trying to stay sober because, his, uh, he, you know, he comes from a devout Muslim family. His uncle's in his final days of cancer. And uh, as he's trying to stay sober, there's this sort of dark revelation that occurs. And then it's uh, the story is about seeing how he's going to react with that and deal with that. That's the trailer playing right now. Uh, and aside from addiction and mental health, there's something else we touch on is sexual abuse. So every, there's a lot of uh, heavy subject matter. So long. You need to stay so again. Well, I want to. Do you want me to see you? They've been treating me like I murdered or raped someone. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. I felt like an outcast my whole life, and now I feel like a criminal. What you say they treat you like has had to be. I need me to acknowledge this. Why wouldn't she believe you? That's not all that happened. You get belligerently fucked up and hurt other people and you don't even care. You can't avoid this. I can't take it anymore. Sarah, bus! Society is sick. So why do we blame ourselves? What was the, the key message that you were really trying to get across in this particular film? Um, it was, you know, this was uh, a character exploration journey. So it was uh, a way, it was almost slice of life in a sense, which is what like the challenges were, uh, you know, in terms of putting in so much of a story in 20 minutes, like you said. But it was mm -hmm. really about trying to convey what, you know, this guy's psyche and uh, him being in this very dark place and not having the support system and dealing with the combination of a lot of self-hatred and, um, you know, this thing of feeling very ostracized and uh, just seeing how far someone can go in that pursuit of uh, finding some redemption. That was definitely a big aspect of, of this character's journey. Mm -hmm. So this was your baby. It de yeah, it definitely was my baby for sure. It was like a six month journey from start to finish. Wow. So it took up a half a year just writing it to going through the whole, you know, production, post production process. So it was okay. a lot of time. Yeah. Okay. So, Ali, how did you get into this in the first place? What, what's, did you like go to film school or? Um, I, I did study uh, film history in college, but I, I uh, just have always been like a film fan. I've always wanted to be an actor and didn't really pursue this till later a bit till after school. Um, but I, I went to acting school um, after undergrad and uh, went to the neighborhood playhouse in New York. So my, my training is in acting. So I'm self-taught as a writer, uh, filmmaker. Uh, Brendan McGowan, you're the cinematographer on the film and um, one of the strengths of this particular story is the writing and that sort of subtle bringing you along while this character kind of develops in front of us. What did you want to put into making the film and in the, into the cinematography part as far as making the, the visual to mm. make that possible? Um, I think my, I would say my primary, uh, overall theme would be intimacy it was like this, the most important, uh, thematic element I wanted to kind of convey that that everything felt very um, intimate, close, and and the images got tighter and more claustrophobic the further along into the story we went. So they were wide and they were very broad towards the beginning. And then um, so the, the, the darker and more rapidly down 
this spiral that Abdul goes down, the shots kind of begin tighter and tighter. And some of the more climactic scenes, I wanted to shoot them almost a little bit abstract as if the camera's sort of passing by and and um, disoriented kind of the way um, Abdul sees his own, like, you know, every character in the story is a little bit um, at odds with one another. And there's a little bit of, um, gaslighting and a little bit of manipulation and a little bit of sort of everyone's sort of waging a weird kind of psychological warfare with one another and so I, I wanted to con convey this kind of like disjointed disoriented like every character has a different kind of narrative and the way we see them uh, through the lens is different for for each one of them and the way they interact with one another now technologically was there a particular technological technique or um, mechanical thing you used to make that possible like a steady cam or something that we would know about or you know what how did you achieve that particular effect um i shot the entire film essentially on two lenses uh with the exception of some exteriors i used um a uh 25 millimeter zeiss <clears throat> lens, a uh, Zeiss Prime lens, and then I used um, my favorite lens in the world is a it's this old vintage Russian lens called a Helios, um, uh, and it um, it's um, it's just this gorgeous lens that kind of has this beautiful sort of distorted quality and a nice bokeh, and it's it's very um, um, kind of dreamlike and and soft and. Uh, um, and then yeah, there I used a steady cam in one shot. Well, two shots technically. One is more expository, um, but on the other one was in the moment when Sarah has a panic attack. To, panic attack. I wanted to sort of use this. She's walking through the hallway and coming out of the hallway, and I went for this kind of German expressionist, stark, <laughs> geometric kind of Dutch, scary thing when she's having her panic attack coming through the hallway to sort of convey that kind of, um, you know, because the steady cam feels like you're on boat that's disorienting and mm -hmm. unsettling and uh, can, can be kind of nauseating i think most people use it for stability and i i like to use a steady cam because it floats and is very kind of strange and disorienting and, and uh so it is different yeah and and um i think it, it looked really cool i actually fought for that shot <laughs> during the editing process because i thought it was so effective so yeah you see some of like that examples of those intimate shots and um that's not all that happened and Brandon, how did you meet Ali? How did you get wrapped up in this project? Um, I don't remember Ali. How did how I met you? I think um, I think we somehow just paths crossed somewhere online, and then and then uh, we had a couple of uh, phone calls, and then and then yeah, we started started working on it pretty much immediately. Okay. Yeah. And was it sort of a six month project for you as well, or was it a lot more towards the end? um i came in what would you say ali maybe a, a couple months before um so i think the genesis of the, the film was came before me um and then um uh, i joined on to point a camera at some stuff um but yeah <laughs> okay yeah cinematographer is more than just pointing the camera though right <laughs> yeah i mean i'd like to think so yeah, yeah. okay um, yeah <laughs> okay. Brandon, was there anything that you had to do as the cinematographer to make sure that this the whole story was told in this short term? Um, I think um it's a matter of efficiency, I think. Um okay. uh not uh, um from behind the camera, but like, you know, as far as what you're trying to um um, I, you know, my background is, um, as a DP and director is, um, in music videos. Um, so a lot of, you know, I, I'm often trying to tell a big story in about three to five to seven minutes. Um, and I think it's just, you know, there's like an acting principle called economy of movement. And I think the same can be applied to like what you're actually, um, depicting, um, on the other side of of a lens and, and, you know, in the case of this film, everything, it had to be, the image just kind of had to be succinct a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, 90% of it is, is handheld and it's just, you're just kind of 
on the subject. There's not a lot of extraneous movements or big sort of elaborate um, shots. A lot of it is just you're very direct. It feels as if some, you know, out in the in the style of the cinema verite or something. It's just meant to look like, you know, the the camera is a presence. The camera is is you watching what's happening as opposed to um, these sort of elaborate, intricate movements that kind of just waste time. Um, in the case of a short like this, yeah. Okay. Uh, Brendan, um, working on this set with a really emotional story like this, was it difficult for you guys, for the crew, to kind of maintain? Because everybody's gone through something, and every once in a while you can be triggered by the work that you do when it's got nothing to do with the work that you're doing at the moment. You know what I mean? Uh, yes. We had a um, we had a, a really good crew on this. Um, everybody, I think, recognized the gravity of, the subject matter um and there were a few you know there are a few times where we really took a moment to kind of check in there are some um especially graphic or just sort of heavy and intense sequences um and it's easy i think to get caught up in like making the thing to actually um you can get so caught up in it that you you forget that what actors i mean ali was really in it um and uh, you can sense the energy in the room, and sometimes it's easy to just get lost in like what you're doing and what you're supposed to be doing, um, regardless of what your position is. And I think this crew, especially um, being relatively small and being all very present and just getting along very well, I think we we were all pretty tapped into what was happening. And um, you know, it wasn't like we were looking for levity or anything within creating it or anything. I think we just had um, we we understood the assignment we understood the the necessity of being efficient while also acknowledging um uh how i mean traumatic all the events that we were uh, documenting are yeah and i i felt lucky because this was uh the first collaboration for everyone all, all you know all the crew and all the cast members this was the first time we were all working together and uh, the attitude everyone had and the energy everyone brought was really good. And I feel like we immediately gelled together, you know, from the first uh, day, from the first scenes we started shooting. And uh, yeah, and it's like by the end of it, you know, it's like you've become this tight knit group, you know, because you're like, you have to work as a unit. And uh, but the sense of support was there, you know, which was really nice and great. And like Brennan said, the kind of intimacy, you know, and the presence that everyone had was there. That's great. Now, the the two main actors other than yourself are the well young lady who pay, played your sister and your mother who were they yes so uh the lead actress her name is anya Banerjee. she uh we had connected uh someone had you know referred me to her say hey there's another actress you should know and we connected and then i sent her the script and she read for me she did send an audition and it was terrific like it was a real standout tape and she's a really great actress and she mm -hmm. flew out from Los Angeles uh, for the weekend to to work with us on this project. Um, and uh, and then NG I uh, connected with as well. And uh, she also did a phenomenal job. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, they're both both like actresses that did really great work. You know, and uh, like we've been saying, like there a lot of uh, intense scenes, but they really just deliver on them. Yeah, especially the stairs a, culminating the Thanks. Yeah, it was a it was a terrific production. Which brings up the question, Ali. This was your you're the director. You're also the star. How did you have to work with your crew to sort of get the the shot you wanted and the performance from yourself that you were looking for when you're not on the other side of the camera watching what you do? Trust was the big thing. You know, I I wanted uh, the the set to feel like a, a safe space. So I mm -hmm. talked a lot about that with the actors and the actor side of it in terms of how I was directing the actors. You know, we did rehearsals um, and uh, had about, about two weeks to rehearse with my actors. Um, and then with the crew, you know, everyone was just very like, you know, very focused, diligent. I mean, it was, you know, we're covering a lot of pages every single day. Um, and so if I'm in a shot and, you know, Brendan says, this looks good, you know, I, I, had that trust in him to trust his opinion. And when I wasn't in the scene and I was, I was able to watch what was going on. So, you know, it's, it's uh, part of it is like the prepare as much as you can. And you never feel like you can, you can always feel like you could prepare more, 
so that when you're there, you're just trying to be present. And then the other aspect of it was like trying to not micromanage, which I think kind of goes hand in hand with that too, because you get your confidence from your prep. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, you know, it was just my first time uh, directing and also wearing so many hats. I was just listening to a lot of directors, like watching interviews. I spoke to some directors as well who are starting out, who, you know, have done tons of shorts and are doing like their first or two features. Um, and uh, yeah, just kind of got that advice. It's just like, I guess you have to, if, if everyone working with you really knows the story and uh, then you can try and what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to express, then you can just trust them to do their jobs. And you just have to make sure you're communicating what we're going for and, and know that they'll deliver on, on their front with that, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, normally um, one of the complaints you get about films currently is that people kind of hit you over the head with the message, right? There's the message and they kind of bang you with that over and over. And I thought you were a lot more subtle in that, in the way you presented it in this story. Um, how did, was there something that you specifically wanted to target to make that possible or, you know, how did, how did that come across when you were creating this story? That, I mean, that's important to me as a writer to never be mm -hmm. didactic. You know, I think that even just like the film references we had, uh, and, uh, just my own kind of personal philosophy on storytelling and writing, I'm very big on not wanting to be didactic. Um, and so like a writer that I love is David Mamet and he has this book and he talks about that, that it's, it's about, you know, your, the journey that you're taking them on and it's about catharsis ultimately. So mm -hmm. this character does have a catharsis except that he's an anti-hero. And so his catharsis is, is not one that the audience would necessarily agree with, you know, but um, from his subjective point of view, uh, it was about getting to that place of catharsis. And the challenge one was in setting up where he was coming from in such a short time span mm -hmm. mentally that is yeah and emotionally sure. yeah okay now both of you have um mentioned a lot of international influences and this movie specifically has um it's a south asian family what 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 is the the origin of the family and in, in the characters in the in the movie rather than uh, me trying to guess oh yeah so they're uh Pakistani background okay but you don't hit people over the head with that. It's not like you see a lot of movies where you get an ethnic family and they keep talking about the old country and back home, this is what we used to do. And it's a lot more subtle than that. Was that purposeful or was that part of the message? What, why did it come across the way it did? Um, I think it was, you know, like culture and it was obviously set in, you know, that family. And so you see, you know, what, the dynamics are of family members from that background, but mm -hmm. you know, that aspect of them is just a layer of the story and who they are. And the story isn't really, isn't about culture or identity crisis, or I think any of the topics that uh, you see a lot of when it comes to specifically to Brown stories that are mm -hmm. coming up and which are, you know, great when they're done well, but this was, you know, it was uh, a specific story in terms of what we're about and, it's set in that context and it's a niche context for people to, you know, see a story like this, just cause I think a lot of a story like this hasn't been made often. And that's also why we felt very excited to tell it, but still the things we hit on are, are very universal, you know, um, addiction, you know, uh, codependency and relationships, family trauma. We're, we're hitting on very universal things here that I think everyone will relate to and, and identify within some level, I think. Um, so definitely, you know, I think the authenticity of capturing that, that was something that as actors we got to do and bring, you know, but which was great, which was fun. I'd never shot something like this before. Um, but in terms of the story, it was um, not what the story's about. Fundamentally. If I were to try to make a, an independent film of my own and I was looking for actors like you, the three of you, where would I look? Um. You know, there's if you're just posting a short any project, there's actors to access and all those kinds of websites that actors always are on uh, looking for work. Um, it Anya had actually met also through this actors workshop, uh, part of this group called Gullikers. It's a South Asian uh, group collective of actors and writers, and we have like workshops. Uh, so I'd met her at a workshop. We were just working on monologues, and we like give each other critiques. 
Uh, so that's like a, a little group that I'm a part of. Um, so there's, you know, those kinds of resources as well. If you're looking specifically for a South Asian um, actor to play that kind of role. And where did you study acting? Uh, it's called the Neighborhood uh, Playhouse. It's in New York. Okay. And Brandon, how about you? Where did you study? Uh, what? Cinematography? What? How do you, <laughs> <laughs> how do you um, title the job that you do? Uh, director of photography, you know, that director of photography, well, okay. photography on this particular film. But my background is actually in acting as well. I, I, I'm a classically trained actor. I have a degree in acting from Cal Arts, um, wow. out in California. Um, and so, you know, hearing hearing uh, Ali's very um, optimistic and positive philosophy on the audition process is, <clears throat> you know, warm to hear. <laughs> um, uh, I I was um, I did it for a few years in LA and it was very taxing um, and I got tired of waiting for um, permission you know to to make things to participate um, and so I just started um, I I moved to New York and and started directing um, and just spend a lot of time with cinematographers that I respect and love and they sort of kind of showed me the ropes and I spent a lot of time reading and studying cinematography on my own and I'm I'm a self-taught um, cinematographer. I, I uh, never really studied it formally. Um, and so I, I always try and, uh, so I direct a little bit of theater and a little bit in film and stuff. And sometimes I outsource the cinematography, but a lot of times I just shoot whatever I'm directing myself. Um, and I, you know, I think uh, Ali and I had some conversations about my acting background and how I try and sort of find a way to translate an actor's perspective um, to the camera and, and sort of how to involve the camera in a story um, in a way that comes from like sort of an actor's kind of mindset that both serves the actors in front of the camera and serves the story. Um, so, yeah. That's yeah, I'm an actor turned camera person. So the fact that everybody, pretty much everybody involved with this short film has a background in acting one way or another is part it's of why good. the it's acting was so acting strong well. in the film. That makes a lot of sense then. Okay. So if you were to recommend people who were trying to make films of their own, would you suggest they go out and study acting as part of the process? Yes. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. If okay. you're a director, uh, you know, and, and you never have no, if you know nothing about acting and you're trying to give actors notes, it can get, you know, messy sometimes. I think just the conversations are just so much easier when you understand other processes, you know, mm -hmm. conversations between all of us just felt a lot, very seamless. Mm -hmm. And I also think that just from the perspective of, uh, finding common ground, I think, um, there's there's a trad traditionally a very old kind of uh, disconnect between one side of the camera and the other side of the camera, um, and I think um, people that understand how one, how the other person does their job and and what goes into it, um, you know, a lot of people think that acting is easy and it's not, um, and. Uh, yeah, I think I think everybody on on a film set should study acting, <laughs> and and everybody and everybody should try doing everything else on a film. Every actor should try doing other things. As well. But I thought acting and cinematography are easy because they're on TikTok, right? That's the girl asks her boyfriend to hold the the phone and she dances up and down, and that's that's acting, right? Isn't isn't that that's uh, how I learned? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of a lot of TikToks. Yeah, yeah, yeah and and that the guy who plays the uncle, the actor who plays the uncle doesn't have a single line. So it's just all acting with the face and the eyes, which he did really well. And really just the way he used his body in certain shots, we had some specific shots that say focused on, you know, whatever the angle might've been, he just knew how to perform, but you know, what we needed. If, if say he was like lying on a bed and we needed a shot from here, he'd go, okay, I get how to work with that. So that was great. Now you said that you were inspired by film noir. When yeah. you put it together, I would say that particularly the shots with the uncle were the ones that reminded me most of film noir because of the way you guys staged that. But also, um, 
your character Ali, we can hear his inner dialogue. That's and it, I, I don't hear the inner dialogue from the other characters. Was that part of that film noir aspect you were looking for, or was that just something that you really wanted us to get that side of what he's thinking in the moment? Yeah. The, ca the character's name is uh, Abdul. I'm sorry, Ab Abdul. You're Ali. I apologize. Uh, yes. <laughs> no worries. Uh, yeah, I I was just kind of having a noir and a neo noir phase, and I a lot of those elements of those films uh, were things that I, I was kind of getting excited by in terms of like you know making up a story and telling a story and playing with those elements um yeah what was the second part of the question but the the film noir was sort of an inspiration for this and one oh the voice recognized was the uncle but the other one was the, right. the dialogue the the inner dialogue yeah was that was that part of what you were shooting for was that film noir feeling or was that something be, particularly because it's a short film and you've got a lot to cover in short film was that a tool you use just for that or because of the inspiration? Uh, not actually not even, I was just kind of playing around with that. Um, okay. so yeah, it was just, that was something I was just playing with, uh, in terms of adding another layer to my character, Abdul, who's a very internal character. And that was part of the challenge of playing him. It, it, it's very tough playing someone internal cause you have to be totally present as the person, the actor pr doing the performance, but not, try to be internal but still kind of convey what's going on and there's moments where i'm you know, not talking much or you know just saying very very few words in certain scenes and others I'm, I'm a bit more expressive so i just thought it'd be interesting to kind of play with that and show a little uh of a different side of him it also shows how um the sister misinterprets what he's thinking and you can see why and how she would misinterpret that because that inner dialogue says something completely different than what she seems to believe he's thinking. And um, yeah. they, it really it drives that the story in a different direction than what you would expect if it hadn't been there. Yeah, and that's another thing with this being a short and out of feature in terms of how much context you have. And the, the kind of fun thing to play with was that you don't ever fully know what someone's thinking either. So it was kind of just playing with that, especially with someone who's, you know, when you're dealing with characters where one of the kind of aspects of the story is like truth versus deception and, and authenticity or self-awareness versus like lying to yourself. Uh, and and um, so there's that element of it is there. And so that was just another kind of fun thing to play with in their, you know, in their dynamic. And, you know, when he's listening, you think she thinks he's listening and then he's actually his thoughts are off somewhere else and he doesn't really have control of his thoughts. He's very overwhelmed by his thoughts. Now the music was something you had composed as well, yes? Yeah, I had a uh, some. I had a composer. I went to school with him, and he uh, did a really perfect job. And he made all original music for the film. So um, he made some really good music for the film. Yeah. Yeah, it's terrific. Now, was that done after the film was completed? Everything else was done, and then he did the music. So I started talking to him before production, and he had sent me a few samples, and it became this kind of ongoing uh, conversation where which just happened to be the way that we both of us like to work. Uh, and so it kept changing. You know, he sent me some stuff. I'd give him my thoughts and then I'd shared material with him. Uh, you know, I shared like a, a rehearsal with him before we production. Then after production, I shared footage and then I would share the cuts. And then as we got deeper and deeper into editing, um, you know, it that collaboration with him got tighter because he was then, you know, scoring the music literally like for each frame. Like when it started and ended, it was, very specific so it was, yeah it was also like a big collaboration post that was terrific now did he perform that or did you get someone else to perform the music um it's all i mean there's no audio there's no voice uh in any of the music it's just like you know yeah piano yeah, and percussions instrumentals yeah yeah it was all him though he did that yeah. now did you have to do a, a post-production audio for the voices for the actors so we actually, uh, there's a section where there's some voiceover of actors whose footage you never see. Uh, and that's actually because their scenes were cut, unfortunately, because uh. the film was so long. Um, so there were two other supporting characters, uh, Monica and Kate, um, who did a really good job. And it just, it wouldn't work, uh, unfortunately, because it's a short and we're just packing in way too much. So it was something that I had to do, unfortunately, 
Um, and then we had the same guy who did sound, also did the sound mixing in post as well, Dave. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Now, Brendan, you work with a lot of music videos, and you've got this acting background as well. Were you kind of imagining music in the back of your head while you're filming this? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I had heard the music before. Um, Ali sent me some of the music. <clears throat> some of the music while we were in pre-production, um, which was great. So I think tonally, I under I had an idea. Like I think ha having heard the music, I was like, okay, um, it that kind of gave me license to go as dark as I felt reflected okay. both the concepts in the script and the way the music sounded. Um, you know, the same with doing a music video. It's like sometimes if i'm working with like a real black metal intense band it's like you can go really dark i um, mean so you you kind of gauge um the aesthetic based on the music um and in this case yeah i think that was that was part of it i don't know how how conscious i was of that i think that may have just been kind of like a automatic you know being informed by the tone of the music but um yeah i think that i think that especially those very noir shots um they they really um feel reflective of the tone of the music yeah now ali the impression i'm getting is that this was all happening sort of at once you've got music you've got production you've got set decoration you've got your writing you're still doing some editing with the writing you're acting yourself you've got other actors coming in and out how did you sort of balance that personally like how did you get through the day without crying in the corner <laughs> um yeah i mean it it was definitely like juggling the different hats was some uh learning experience um you know i think that the part that was the biggest challenge was also being the producer while being the director actor uh i think that was you know really the thing that i felt like was the biggest learning curve for me just because there's all these responsibilities but you know it i, I think that because i was shooting something that i had written myself I, I knew what I was written on the page, you know, I, I knew what the intention was. And so I think that uh, I, I would only direct things that I've written myself. Okay. Yeah. But how did you sort of take care of yourself while you're going through this pretty complex process in a very short time? Like you said, you, you did most of the filming in a weekend, right? Yeah. So it, it was, um, you know, like from the moment you start and you're in pre-production, you just kind of see it as like a marathon. And you just have to use as much of your time as you can for prepping. And it feels like it goes very fast. Um, but once you're in production, it is very intense. And it was supposed to be a four day shoot because of this weather storm. It became kind of like a little less than three and a half. Um, so it became even more intense, especially one day we did like double duty essentially and shot almost twice the amount of page counts as we were initially supposed to. Um, I think we shot like nine pages of material on the third day of filming. Yeah. Um, so that it was exhausting, but it, it, I honestly, there was a lot of coffee involved. I, I did try to get as much sleep. I, I definitely believe in not being sleep deprived. So, you know, you make as much time of that as you can. Um, and, uh, and then once the filming was over, you just, then you get to take a break before you go into editing. So I knew that that's when I would have that moment. And I think the adrenaline and just the excitement of doing it, I wasn't thinking about that at the time. You know, it wasn't until we were, we wrapped that I kind of like just I collapsed on the couch and was like, all right, I'm going to like just chill for like two days now and do nothing. That sounds like a clever plan. Brendan, how did you guys, you both said that um, your advice to new people was to sort of stick it out, to have that, that marathon and mentality because you were behind the camera, you're doing all this heavy lifting of cameras and shots and angles and things. How did you maintain, how did you, take care of yourself while you're going through this sort of marathon for three and a half days uh yoga <laughs> yoga um yeah um um i don't know yeah you kind of got to stay in shape if you're if you're swinging a camera around um and be flexible and take care of yourself um i'm i'm also big on not eating much during it was like a habit i developed as an actor on long shoots like not just sort of you know, pigging out during your lunch break because it slows you down and makes you feel all one. You're distracted, mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I still kind of maintain that. I'm like, 
light diet, lots of yoga. Um, and yeah, get a lot of sleep. I'm, I'm not someone who likes burning the midnight oil. So I'm like, when it's bedtime, it's bedtime. That's yeah, great. I agree about the food. You definitely don't want to, if you're about to do like a, a heavy acting scene and you've just stuffed yourself with you know, a lot of food, like carbs, especially. And, you know, we had like snacks and bars and all that sort of thing, but I realized like all that stuff you're putting in your body does affect you and your mental clarity. And, you know, you can crash then if you're just putting a lot of bad stuff in your body. So, and that, and also just you brought to my mind when you said yoga, I meditate too. So try to start my day off with that. And that, that helps me kind of clear my mind and focus. Good advice. I'll, I'll have to keep that in mind for my own work. Yeah. yeah. Meditation, yoga, and uh, don't eat so much for lunch. That's a good idea. It works. All right. I noticed the Pennsylvania license plate in the film, and you said it was filmed in New York. What part of Pennsylvania do you live in? I'm from Northeast PA, um, around the Scranton area. Okay. Yeah. I, I think you're also from not too far. You're like kind of also in Northeast PA roughly, right? Uh, yes and no. I work up in Northeast PA, up in the Poconos, and I live further south, outside of Reading. Mm. So it's a little bit further to the south. Yeah. And Brendan, where are you from originally? Uh, I'm from Atlanta. Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia. Yes. You don't talk like you're from down there. No, that is, uh, that's acting school for you. They beat it there out you go. when I was in acting school. And then, you know, I mean, I have a couple of martinis and <laughs> generally it's not there. No. Okay. Okay. So Ali, we, we can say that your Easter egg was the Pennsylvania license plate and his was yeah. the uh, poster in the background of the bedroom. Yeah, there you go. Hey, yeah. yeah. Repping PA. <laughs> yeah. But actually, we shot the film where I'm currently living uh, in my house in Astoria. And to the credit of Brendan and our set designer, Armani, uh, they made the inside of this house, which has got me and three other guys in our 20s, look like the home of a family. So that was really impressive how they pulled that off. So that is uh, that is impressive. Can, that yeah. was great. Yeah, Armani really a shining star of the film. The the, the uh, production design is really impressive. Yeah, you would never know that the, <laughs> yeah. the, the uh, of uh, Ali's apartment. Um, now, how long did that impressive. take? Oh, that we that like the turnaround of just transforming the house was like a, a day or two. So it was very quick. It was, so it was a lot of, you know, hustle on her part and yeah, every room had to be changed and everything had to be moved and, you know, kind of utilizing every corner we could find. I mean, just like where, what we, what space we used to turn into the living room, like you wouldn't believe it, you know, if you saw what, what we were actually working with. So it was really cool. It was very <laughs> phenomenal. Yeah. It doesn't look any, it, it, it actually looks like a fairly open house on film. Mm. It's you guys show a, a lot of spaciousness, which is nice. Yeah, it looks like yeah. a very pleasant home. Yeah, Brennan used, made good use of the windows too. So you have the windows and the natural light coming in, and some of those shots so that helped a bunch. And then, and then uh -huh. night shots where it's tighter and more claustrophobic. It's darker as well. Yeah, yeah. The difference in the lighting from one part of the story to the next was pretty dramatic. Yeah, you can you can really feel it. Now you guys are submitting this film to film festivals, yes? Yeah. How yeah. what's the process with that like? Like who who's going to be looking at your film now? I mean, that a lot of that is you just click and submit and then you just hope to hear good news down the road. Uh so, you know, I submitted it to a lot of places and um you know, I'll, I'll be hearing soon enough later this year. Um so yeah, hopefully the, the, the film gets uh, accepted in certain festivals and we get to screen it and show it. And um, so I'm excited for that. And what are the plans after that? That's There's a film festival season, right? And then after that, it kind of goes out into the world. What are your right. plans for uh, putting it out in the world after that? Right. So it's not publicly viewable right now, but it will be once that you know, season is over. And then, yeah, we're gonna, I'm going to put it out, you know, put it on YouTube. Um, find other, you know, ways to distribute it. There's lots of, uh, you know, new uh, websites and platforms. And so I'll just try to put the film out there as much as I can. 
um, and market it out there as much as I can. I think it's a, an important story. It's a story we all, a film we all feel very proud of. You know, we all feel proud of the work. And um, uh, yeah, so look out, I guess, for later in 2022 for that. So what are what are your plans, the two of you? What are you guys doing now or what are you doing next? Yeah, I mean, I always have a million things going on. I wrapped up a music video, got another music video happening. There's always like a million, some some films in the works. Yeah, just kind of, you know, uh, trying to stay busy and, and working on as many things as, as possible. And that's that. Yeah. Okay. Holly, what have you got coming up? Uh, I'm, you know, back at the uh, drawing board in terms of stories. So got just developing different story ideas back in that early stage. Uh, you know, I, I like to take my time with the writing process. Um, with this one, this was like two months to write it. So it took a lot of time and I like to take my time and, you know, work on different things at the same time before I feel like I, I'll know for sure what I want to shoot next. And I'm an actor. So, you know, just auditioning busy with auditioning and trying to stay busy with that any projects coming up that you're auditioning with yeah i mean there's you know i'm getting i get auditions from my agent so you know you get them and you just you, you do them and then you just kind of on to the next one you know yeah you, you don't you don't get you don't get clingy about it as my no. philosophy yeah no it's auditioning in particular you're uh, rejected what nine out of ten times when you're really good yeah, probably more. Sounds about yeah. right. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's gluttony for punishment to keep auditioning over and over. That's the only way to get the job. Yeah, you have to love the process. I've come to realize, you know, like you got to enjoy auditioning because it's an opportunity to work. That's that's what people have said. So that's how I view it. Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't heard it described that way. That makes sense. That's a now, healthy. Philosophy. Yeah. Someone's getting new into the business. This is something they've wanted to do for a long time. What would you advise a new person? Advise a new person coming into the business as far as you know, real quick. This is what you need to do. Rob Reiner said, as a director, what you need to do is change your shoes at least once a day because you're gonna have really long days. So, do you have any anything as pithy as that you want to add as advice? Don't quit. Quitting okay. is very very tempting. Uh, don't do it. Ouch! That hurricane must have really gotten in the way. Yeah, what would you advise for new people coming in? <laughs> um, you just got to, kind of along the same lines, but a little different. Uh, you just got to do it as much as you can, you know? So for me, this was me making my own opportunity, not being able to work as much as I wanted. Um, and I think you just got to do it, find ways of doing it. And just, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and it takes time. So you just got to be in it for the long run, you know? And, and figure out how to mentally be okay with that despite the, uh, you know, the, the challenges and obstacles along the way in the journey. Not an easy journey. And I'm still getting started too, you know. It feels like even though I've been doing it for like five years. <laughs> People could be doing this for 30 years and feel like they're still new at it, I think. True. Yeah, it's quite a challenging task putting all this stuff together. I want to say congratulations. The film is really, really good. Um, I was really impressed by the whole thing. And the fact that you fi finished an entire story the way you did in the 20 minutes was really impressive. And, um, you know, I, I really, of, of all the strengths the movie has, what impressed me the most was the writing. But pretty much anything that I could point to, I could say, you really did that well. So this was a, a real project you guys could be proud of. And I hope it uh, gets a lot of attention in the future because of that. Thank you. So, I appreciate that. Um, you know, it's it's an indie film, but I think they're just hopefully I, I feel like we put like a lot of soul into it. Um, and it's you know it's about family and people, and it's just uh, we just wanted to tell a story that deals with uh, you know um, I guess nuanced things, but with like a lot of humanity. So that's like what I'm very proud of. Uh, and that was sort of like what I was hoping to kind of pull off when I was writing this. And uh, which is why I'm like really proud of like just how it all came together and the work everyone did. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, I don't really see it as, I see it less as like a, 
a lesson or a message and just more as like just something wanting that I wanted to express through what the character's journey was. And, and sure, people can have like their own interpretations of why they think someone did this or that, you know, but I, I think it's also been kind of cool to hear that. It's cool to hear other people's opinions and thoughts on uh, the people in the story afterwards. And hopefully, you know, once we put this out, we get, get to have like those kinds of conversations and even broader conversations about the really important things that the film touches on in terms of uh, issues like, yeah, say, in society or mental health. Ali Ahmed, Brendan McGowan, this has been a real pleasure talking with you both. Um, the film was Buried and Forgotten, which is not about the uncle who has cancer necessarily. But uh, the main character, Ali, is coming home to visit his family, and we Abdul. see the the drama. <laughs> I, I did that again. It's Abdul, right? The main yeah. character, Abdul. I apologize, man. It's all good. Coming home to, to visit family. And um, it's a 20-minute film that's being released to film festivals and will be out to the regular public after that. Gentlemen, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Thanks for doing this. It's been yeah. great. Yeah.